Ah yes, the Stanton system. Beautiful for sure, but how realistic is it from a science perspective? Today's video is brought to you by GameGlass. GameGlass allows you to take control of your ship from a tablet or phone. All the key bindings are neatly divided into well-designed shards, meaning you always have easy access to the exact features you need, regardless of what you're doing. On top of that, GameGlass also works with Elite Dangerous, so extend your cockpit and get the full immersive experience. Follow the link in the video description and try GameGlass for free. If you like it and want more shards and features, you can either buy them individually or subscribe to Glass Pass. Use offer code DTEA and get 5% off your first purchase. Hello ladies and gentlemen and welcome back. So I thought it would be fun to take a look at the Stanton system, not from me as a gamer's perspective, but with me as an astrophysicist and take those perspective on it and see how realistic this system is. Now let's start with the Stanton star itself. Information is a little scarce, but what we do know from in-game is that it is a G-type main class star, just like the sun. We don't know its subclass, in case you're not familiar with it, every class is not only classified into its major class, which is its letters, it also has subclasses that goes from uh, 9 to 0, where 9 is the coldest and 0 is the hottest. The sun is a G2 star, so it is in the hotter category of a G-type star. We don't know the subcategory of the Stanton star, so we're going to make some assumptions based on that. But if we compare stuff like the Goldilocks zone or habitable zone for the sun, we can kind of use that as a reference and say it probably shouldn't be much further out than that. Assuming that this the Stanton is, is potentially smaller or colder, we would expect the Goldilocks zone to move in closer to the star in terms of distance. And we're going to use that in a bit when we're going to talk about the different planets. But before we move out and talk about the planets, I just want to mention that in a keynote from 2018, it was mentioned that all the main planets have been scaled down by a factor of 1 to 6. So there's only 1 6 scale of what they would be in reality. They have done this to reduce travel times and make the game a little bit more, I would say, playable. So this is a gamer perspective, which I can, can definitely appreciate. But we have to compensate for that when we begin to take measurements in game to calculate the size of the planet. Now, it wasn't really clear whether this also was applied to distances within the solar system. But as we will see in a second, I'm pretty sure it is. Now, if we start at Hurston, the closest planet to the star, in-game it has a size of about... 2,000 kilometers in diameter, scale that up, it's around 12,000 kilometers in diameter, about the same size as the Earth. However, if we measure the distance into the Stanton star, we see that in-game it is 0 0.09 astronomical units. That is extremely close, like very, very close. Just to put that into perspective, the orbit of Mercury in our solar system is about 0 0.3 to 0 0.4 astronomical units, but here we're talking about 0.09 astronomical units. So this is extremely close. And because of this, and we'll see the same thing happening with many of the other planets, I am pretty sure that the distances between planets has also been scaled down by a factor of one to six. Because if we then scale it up, that gives us a distance of 0.54 astronomical units out to Hurston, which is more realistic of what I would expect to see a planet. And again, this would or could potentially be in the habitable zone if we assume that the Stanton star is on the colder side of a G-type spectrum. So this could be on the, I would say, the inner edge of what I would call a habitable, and depending on the atmosphere, of course. Moving out to the second planet, we weirdly enough have Crusader, the only gas giant in, uh, in Stanton. And, and I use the word giant very loosely here. Crusader is about 10,000 kilometers-ish. Uh, in diameter in game, scale it up, that's around 60,000 kilometers in diameter. Compare that to Jupiter, which is 139,000 kilometers. This means that, that Crusader is less than half the size of Jupiter, making this a relatively small gas giant. So, giant in quotation marks here. Also, I find the position of the gas giant to be a little odd. Again, if we calculate the distances out to it, we compensate for the scaling. We have 0 0.738 astronomical units. So remember, the Earth is orbiting at one astronomical unit. So we are still within the orbit of the Earth for a gas giant, which is quite uncommon. You would expect to see gas giants being formed further out in the system, which is something that happens in the early stages of a system when the protostar just ignites and you have this disk of dust and uh, and like small like 
gas clouds and, and small rocks floating around, before they begin to clump together to planets, you will have the gas being pushed out by the radiation of the star out to further distances from the star, which is why we often would expect to see smaller rocky planets being formed close to the star and the bigger, larger gaseous planet would be formed further out. So seeing a gas giant this close to the star is a little weird. Now that's not the only thing that's weird about Crusader, and that is the fact that there's also a asteroid field, an asteroid belt in the Stanton system, which is on the outside of Crusader, so it's in a further out orbit, which is not what you would expect. You would expect to see asteroid belts being formed on the inside, where they would get um, twice the orbit speed or half the orbit time compared to the gas giant or whatever other heavy object. We're going to assume that, that Crusader is the heaviest planet in the system, is by far the largest, so it will most likely also be the heaviest. And therefore you would expect to see an asteroid field form to a, in an orbit where they have half the orbit time, so they resonate with the orbit of the gas giant. This is how uh, asteroid belts are formed. It's the same reason if you look at a planet like Saturn and you see these bands, these bands are created by the numerous numbers of moons orbiting around Saturn. And again, all the asteroids in the rings or the rocks in the rings, they try to fall into bands where they have half or quarter um, orbit times compared to one of the moons. But because there's so many moons, you get quite a complex interference pattern between all these different orbits. And that's what gives you this weird looking uh, ring structure uh, with the bands and different like gaps and then there's suddenly very dense areas in uh, in the rings around a, uh, a ringed planet. But anyway, I just found the position of the asteroid field in the standard system really odd and I would probably have expected to see that closer in. Next up we move out to Arkop. Arkop seems to be slightly smaller than Hurston uh, in game at around 1,900 kilometers in diameter. Scaling that up, that is 11,400 kilometers. So again, just a little bit smaller uh, than the Earth. And the orbit scaled up is 1.05 astronomical units. So Arkop is orbiting at about the same distance um, as the Earth would if we can scale it up. And again, we don't really know exactly the, the temperature of the Stanton star, not that I've been able to find at least. So whether this would be in the habitable zone, it could, could very well be. Um, it could also be slightly on the outside, which would make the planet expecting it to be a little bit more on the cold side. And finally, of course, we have Microtech, the little icy planet way, way out there. But it's not really that small as you would think. It's about a thousand kilometers uh, in diameter, which is half the size of any of the other planets in the system. But scaling that up still 6,000 kilometers. Like compare that to Pluto. Pluto is around 2,000 kilometers in diameter, 2,200, I think. So it is quite a large planet for where it is. Distance wise, it is at around two astronomical units out. And remember, Mars is orbiting at around 1.5 AU away from the Sun. So we are just, just outside the orbit of Mars, even after we scale it up by a factor of six. Now, if the one thing I really want to applaud, that is the fact that they've added all the Lagrange points into the solar system. If you're not familiar with Lagrange point, I'm not going to give you a lecture on that now. But it is natural stable points that creates a gravitational stable point that has been created when you have two objects orbiting each other, most likely like a planet orbiting a star, then you will have five stable gravitational points where you can put objects and they will tend to stay in that position and just follow the same relative position to the orbital body. And so that makes perfect sense and the position in the game and labeling the game is correct. Apart from Arcorp's third Lagrange point, Arcorp L3, as you can see in this screenshot here, the Lagrange point should be exactly opposite from the star. But as you can see here, when I plot a line between Arcorp and Arc L3, it completely misses the star altogether. It's not even close. So the position of that Lagrange point is definitely off. I don't really know why they mispositioned all the other ones. I checked them. They seem to be fine. They seem to be in the correct position. But this one, it's just off for some reason. It seems to be a mistake and I hope something that they will fix in the future. So in general, I feel like the Stanton system is a little under small size. I, If I were to fix this system from a scientific perspective, what I would do is I would move Crusader further out in this orbit, probably move Crusader out to the orbit around where we have Microtech today and then move Microtech even further out. That would make a little bit more sense if we assume that Stanton is a um, a colder G-type star. Moving Crusader out there will, of course, 
also makes more sense with, with the precision of the asteroid field. So in general, that would kind of fix it for me. I know it wouldn't be as good from a gameplay perspective. It would drastically increase travel times in the game. And this is one of the issues. It seems like lore-wise that in Star Citizens, they've gone for that quantum drives do not go superluminal. If you look at even the fastest quantum drives that we have in the game, the XL1 drive, you are still sub light speed. And from a physics perspective, that's perfect. That means we're not breaking any relativity things and we have to do techno babble in order to <laughs> in order to explain why we're traveling faster than the speed of light. But I do also understand that again, if you scale up the system, travel time is going to be a little weird. But I do, of course, understand that Star Citizen is first and foremost a game and that, of course, as a game developer, you both want to make the game realistic, but you also want to make some quality of life upgrades. And to be fair, a two hour quantum drive trip probably wouldn't be the most fun experience for a player. So on a scale from one to 10, I think I'm going to give Stanton a seven. They definitely got a lot of things right, but if you want to make it absolutely scientific correct, it would definitely need a few tweaks. Now, I really hope you like this different. I would love to hear your opinion in the comment section. Also, if there's something you feel like I missed, do let me know down there as well. Thanks a lot for watching. I hope you enjoyed the video. Give it a like, subscribe, and until next time, I will see you guys in space.